Good evening. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and welcome to the forum, and thanks for joining us online. Every year, Grace Cathedral chooses a theme for reflection, and in 2021, our theme is the Year of Healing. As we enter the second year of the pandemic, we know that we need more than healing. We need strength, endurance, and perhaps even more importantly, we need hope. In March of 2019, Larry Brilliant was my guest at the forum. He is a brilliant physician and epidemiologist. He's a key member of the successful efforts by the World Health Organization to eradicate South smallpox in Southeast Asia in the 1970s. And I remember at that forum two years ago, we talked about what we could learn from the history of smallpox as we faced hypothetical pandemics of the future. And then just one year later, COVID-19 entered our lives. Tonight, we welcome back the most perfect guest that we can have on in the year of healing, and he'll help us to put the pandemic in perspective and to help us to understand what's really happening now and what we can expect next. Larry, it's so good to see you tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. We're, we're so glad that you could make it. It's so good to see you, Malcolm. You, you forgot my major accolade, which I consider myself a friend of Grace Cathedral and a, and a friend of, of Malcolm's. Indeed. I actually, um, when we were, they prepared all the kind of the promotional material, the communication material to our, like, I, 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 oh, I had to stop myself because there's so much that I love about you that's so much more important than, you know, those honors that you've received in, in so many different ways. And I, I just felt like they're just playing it too safe and not, and not showing the just full <laughs> breadth of your personality. <laughs> yeah, they didn't start off with the monastery in the Himalayas? Yeah, that's what I wanted to. I wanted to have the monastery in there. I wanted to have, I wanted to have the rock and roll in there. I was like, there's yeah. not, enough, not enough rock and roll in this picture. <laughs> he's a san francisco doctor you know it's <laughs> uh it's so good to have you though it's so good to see you definitely you know um i i was just saying um I, a few people talked to me about tonight and were telling me about how excited they are to tune in tonight and i i, I kept telling them um almost every week of the pandemic i've had these huge questions for you and i I, you know, I, I read the San Francisco Chronicle articles, saw you know you in the press a zillion different times, um, but each week I just had a different a different question. It was I was it was constantly changing. I, I didn't really understand what was happening, and I, I knew that you were the person that, that, with the answers, and I, I knew that we'd have this chance tonight to talk too. Um, but I want you to talk a little bit just about just like that experience with smallpox and and um, just th th that work to, to to try to eradicate that disease. And, and what we can learn from that in terms of what we're doing now. Um, well, first of all, my wife, Gerja, is also on. She's the beautiful woman in the shadow of that rainbow circle, that Buddhist uh, Enzo that's over there. And uh, she and I lived in India for about 10 years. Um, we started off living in a, uh, an ashram, a monastery in the Himalayas. And then um, we both went to work for the World Health Organization uh, to help eradicate smallpox. And when I was hired, I was hired as literally the junior most person, not just on the team, but I think in the history of WHO. <laughs> and while I, I was a physician, I'd sort of forgotten about it because I'd been, you know, I'd been reading the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, the, you know, the Quran, Talmud, everything that in this monastery. And uh, I showed up uh, with hair down to the middle of my back and a, and a big Old Testament looking beard and wearing white pajamas that they may have thought I'd just gotten out of either a lunatic asylum or a prison someplace. <laughs> and they did hire me as the mascot on the team. Uh, they literally had to create a position low enough that they could hire me. <laughs> and so I got to sit at the feet of the world's best epidemiologists. Um, and uh, learn about the history of smallpox, to know that it was a biblical disease, that there was then an unbroken chain of transmission going back to Pharaoh Ramses V. Wow. And I got to stay as we had hundreds of thousands of people making two billion house calls to every corner of India, Bangladesh, Nepal, which is where the last cases of smallpox in the world were. And then I got uh, to visit the last case of a very little major in the wild on earth, a little girl named Rahima Banu on the island of Bola in Bangladesh. And when her scabs fell off and she stopped coughing and there was no more virus in her body and all the virus 
had fallen on the ground and been cooked by the sun and had died. That was the end of that unbroken chain of transmission that had lasted thousands and thousands of years. That virus was gone. And you can feel it, I think, even now as I talk about it. I could certainly feel it then, the gratitude that I had to the good Lord for taking that one form of suffering off of our back. And um, it, it, if you see something like that, and um, I probably was in villages where thousands of little babies died of smallpox, where hundreds of cremation fires of people who had, had spots all over their body, rivers in some places that... Uh, didn't run because of how many dead bodies there were. If you go from, you know, being just a kid, you know, the the mascot, ball boy, and uh, I wound up running that India program, program in India, and I saw the last case of smallpox. How can you not ever feel a sense of awe, mm. gratitude, and a spiritual um, awakening that, um, how could you ever not feel optimistic and um, and, you know, it's, I, I love that too, because I think that sometimes people think that there's like a, there's an antagonistic relation between religion and science. And I just don't believe that at all. It's like different ages. I mean, I, I, I was reading an article this week about, you know, Jonathan Edwards died as a result of his inoculation, the, the most famous theologian in North America. Um, but it, it was, it was because, yeah, I mean, he didn't die, didn't die because of this, but the, 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 the um, those Puritan ministers that we have such a hard time identifying with were really the intellectual giants of their of their society, and and they were the ones who really pushed for having everybody be inoculated. They they were the most scientific members of their of their of their world, and and they had that appreciation that you had mentioned of just the the beauty and the intricacy and the extraordinary uniqueness of all that we experience. It's. It's a it's a really deep part of my piety. Um, it, you know what the what the physicists are and the astrophysicists are discovering is just it's 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 hugely important for my spirituality. But I wonder I, if you can it, talk a little bit about that. It's just uh, just uh, you know the, the relation between religion and spirituality for you. I, I tweeted yesterday the story of the first vaccine trial in the United States in 1805 in Milton, Massachusetts. A friend of mine, Steve Jones, had sent me this article. So I, I, I decided to tweet it because it was uh, 12 children who had been vaccinated who were then injected with live smallpox to see if the vaccine actually worked. Yeah. And they were held in a, in a room for 14 days until the incubation period of smallpox they thought would have passed. And when they opened the door and they were all alive and well, then all the people gave praise to God. And uh, this guy who wrote up this first... Um, vaccine trial uh, wrote a card and at the top of the card he said uh, uh, he has died on the cross uh, and he wrote about what his experience was watching that gift uh, now that's not to say there aren't other theologians who are are and were on the I, other side of that <laughs> I agree I agree in that moment um, it was really something and and uh, you know for me, my guru told me that that was my spiritual path was to work to alleviate suffering. And he gave it a name, this yoga that he taught me, Nishkam Karma Yoga. You and I've talked about this in the past, but it's, it, it's like saying, as Gandhi said, uh, Kambi Pujahe, work is also a form of worship, a form of yoga. And for me, um, I worked on smallpox and on polio and on blindness and now pandemics. It, it's still, I'm still carrying out my teacher's instructions. Yeah, that's what I love. I, I just, I love the, I mean, the word we, I use for it is ministry. Um, diakonia is the Greek word for it. It's related to the word for deacon. Yeah, you're at, you, you're at the front line. That's what I love so much. It's just just the, the pattern of your life. It's it's evolved to different projects. And and yet there's that that thread that connects them all, which is that that sense of ministry and and, and basically love of other people. I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about the virus, like what is a virus? And then maybe you can talk a little bit about just like this project of making the vaccines. Cause I just remember a year ago, just having people say, you know, don't be, don't, don't, don't be too optimistic about the vaccine coming. It, it may take a while to make this. Um, maybe you can talk about the, that, that whole progress process. So what is a virus? And then, and then how do, how do, how do vaccines get, get made? 
Well, it's almost a theological argument. Is a virus a living thing or right, not? Right, right. I read that article in the New York Times. What, what, is, what is a living thing? It's growth, reproduction, irritability, movement, metabolism, and nutrition. That's what we're taught in medical school. Those, and the virus, this virus doesn't have all those characteristics. So it's considered to not be living, but it does reproduce. In fact, if you think of it, it's a, it's a bunch of RNA, which is a computer code, and it's surrounded by a sack of fat, fatty, oily lipids. That's all it is. It has no intentionality. It's not trying to kill us. It is programmed to do one thing, and that is to replicate and to survive. And because of that, one virus, one person who's sick, gives rise to three others. At the beginning of this outbreak, that was called the reproductive number. Right. And then that becomes an exponent and you have exponential growth. So one case goes to three, goes to nine, goes to 27. And that's how we've gotten to over 100 million. And it's the viruses constantly replicating. And the reason we're at so many different... Earlier, you and I spoke about it. We're not just at one crossroad right now, which we usually are with this pandemic. We're at a dozen different crossroads right now. And one of the biggest crossroads is what about the variants? Yes. And who will win the race between the novel variants and the new vaccines? And we can take that all apart later. But the, the nature of that race and why it's important to everybody is because you want to know that the vaccine you're getting is durable. And I want to say today's vaccine, clobber today's variants. Mm. <laughs> Tomorrow's variants are going to start off with a, a lead in the race. We're spotting them a head start. And why are there variants? Because if we have had 100 million people, actually 120 some odd million people, who are known to have been sick from this virus, and we know that there's three or four asymptomatics that we didn't catch, for every one that we've got, you've got several hundred million people, each of them had tens of billions of viruses in their body. Every one of those viruses has one prime directive, replicate, replicate, replicate. <laughs> and when it replicates, because it's a single strand of RNA, DNA is a double strand. When DNA replicates, one of the strands serves as a spell checker or an editor. Single stand, strand of DNA makes a lot of mistakes. These are called mutations. But you've got billions of viruses in every person, hundreds of millions of people. Multiply those, you have a big number of mutations that are possible. And from that, most of the mutations are harmless or evolutionary dead ends for the virus. But every once in a while, that roulette wheel comes up unfavorable to human beings. And the virus becomes a VOC a variant of concern. Mm. And that invariably is because the new variant, still the COVID disease, still the SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2 virus, but that new one is more transmissible. It affects people faster and faster. And that's what we're facing right now is, you know, whether you call it the UK variant, the California variant, South African variant, Brazilian variant, there will undoubtedly be many, many more. Today's vaccines cover all of them. Today's therapeutics, the monoclonal antibodies that are put together in a, in a cocktail, they clobber all of the known variants. But tomorrow, there will be new variants and they will outfox, outrun, outrace the vaccines. And all the vaccine manufacturers are today working on their next booster shot. Right. So this summer, I expect uh, Pfizer and Moderna to have their booster shots getting ready. Oh, I'm so glad you told me that. Yeah. And, and those booster shots will cover those variants, but it, it will be a race like this. I don't know if you can see my hands, but yeah, yeah. today's vaccine, tomorrow's variants, that booster, and, and we will always stay, a, will always be a step behind, but we will always, so far, we've been able to create the countermeasures that work. And um, I love the image that you give us because you know I, I have felt like there are different, at each stage, there, we've been through these very discrete stages. And you're right, we, we're at these kind of crossroads. And I like the idea of just like a multi-dimensional crossroads. 
because there's that element. And then there's also the element of, you know, will people get the vaccines? And I wonder if you can, will they get vaccinated? And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that because, you know, at the early stages of the vaccination process, um, we may not be paying very much attention to it, but, you know, as it's really available to everyone, then then whether people get the vaccine or not will become much more part of our consciousness. So what, what is current thinking in terms of just whether people will actually get vaccinated? Oh, I think that increasingly uh, more people will get vaccinated and the anti-vaxxers or the people who want to wait and see with, with justifiable skepticism. The mRNA vaccine is a scientific marvel, but it's brand new and we don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, but Gerrit and I can tell you that uh, we got our second vaccine on um, Valentine's Day. We've been married 50 years. We thought that'd be a oh, perfect. <laughs> And uh, yesterday was the 14th day after that. So we are now immunized. Right. And uh, I'll tell you, it, the world feels different. I didn't think I'd be that touched by it, but we were really touched by knowing that, um, that we're immunized and we want everybody else to be immunized. So yeah. um, I will tell you that today with the vaccine in short supply, much more so in the rest of the world, a hundred countries will not get even a quarter of the vaccine they need for the next five years. Oh. So, you know, we've got right now increasing numbers of people being vaccinated, over 2 million a day. We've purchased enough vaccine to vaccinate every man, woman, and child in the United States two or even two and a half times over, more than we need. Soon we're going to be, I hope, donating our excess to the rest of the world. But there'll be a tipping point uh, somewhere in June, July, where instead of being demand driven, we will be supply driven. Mm. And that's when we'll see how many people will have taken the vaccine. I, I wouldn't want people to think that we're going to reach this herd immunity and then there'll be rainbows and unicorns and it's all over and let's go to the beach. <laughs> yeah. It's a slow, gradual process. And we will be dealing with these variants for a while. But once we get a lot of people vaccinated, and we get into this cadence, it will be a little bit like the flu vaccine, where every year you'll get your booster and, you know, it, it won't be this terrifying thing that is always present in the back of our head. Oh, what about COVID? <laughs> and yeah, you know, so I, I, well, I've noticed exactly what you've described, you know, just because... I'm always interacting with people of just every different age range. And my friends who are older who've received the vaccine, it's almost like this huge weight is lifted off them. So it's almost like we're all going through some things in the same way, but but it feels very different, I think, if you're you know, a 67-year-old person who's had the vaccination and versus like a, a 37-year-old person or, or, or a 17-year-old person. It almost makes those differences in our ages just more pronounced. Well, I want to make it clear that I didn't uh, cut in line. I, I, I no, 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 I, exactly. I'm as, I'm as old as you think I am. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I wonder um, if you can talk a little bit about just kind of, I mean, because I remember reading in your book, and I remember talking to you. I mean, it's so funny because there's so many things you taught me in a the very theoretical way that, I, that um, about pandemics and about these terrible diseases. And then, you know, a year after you taught me the last lesson, I, I all of a sudden I'm learning things, th things for myself. But I wonder, in, in, you know, in our conversations, you've always talked about just kind of the role of governments, like how governments can make things better or make things worse. And I wonder if you can just talk about um, just how that happened in terms of just what you see out in the world, like which national governments did a good job of handling it and which ones didn't. And, and what was the difference between um, what, what the groups that succeeded and the ones that didn't? Well, first, I would I would speak to everybody who's watching this. You could be left wing or right wing or Republican or Democrats. Maybe you fell in love with Ayn Rand. Um, I did in high school, but we divorced a couple of years later. <laughs> I'm glad because you're my so friends much cuter. Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, but but whatever your whatever your feeling is about government, surely, if ever there were any reason for government, a pandemic is a perfect reason. Only government, and in fact, only a series of governments working together at a global level could hope to mount an effective um, countermeasure to this. And as you said, uh, or as you implied, Malcolm, there are winners and losers. There are governments that have done a spectacular job like Vietnam and South Korea and Taiwan and New Zealand and Iceland 
And there are governments that have done a terrible job, like so shockingly Sweden and Brazil and the UK and the United States. And for us, it's maybe if you're grading on a curve, we would probably get the lowest grade because we have the most resources. We, we've always led the world in fighting against every other pandemic and whether it was Zika or Ebola or, or swine flu, and we were absent from the global world in fighting this disease. And we were in a, pretty much in a state of denial for most of the first year. So we, we, the virus is bad enough. We shouldn't be adding self-inflicted wounds. But when I say that other countries have succeeded, even before there was a vaccine, Vietnam, Taiwan, South Korea went hundreds of days without a single case. Um, uh, Taiwan had one case, they declared a national emergency. Mm. And in three weeks it was over, no, no COVID. Uh, Adelaide in New Zealand, just uh, the end of last week had two cases. They closed down the city. It'll be open again in a week and there'll be no, no cases in New Zealand. We have not, and that's all before the vaccine. It'll be easier when the vaccine can be applied to that problem as well. But that's not what we've done. And now, now we have a different administration. It has a different uh, ideological belief in the, the value of government. And you're seeing what's happening. We're, we're increasing the number of vaccines. Uh, this $1.9 trillion stimulus package has billions of dollars for contact tracers, for testing, for isolation. If it passes, we will be paying people who otherwise wouldn't be able to isolate themselves because they have to earn a living. Mm. And they, they, they have this Sophie's choice between, am I gonna to go to work and feed my kids or am I gonna stay home and protect my kids from catching the disease that I might get? It, it's, so what the government's gonna step in and do, it's gonna have hotels with those folks who are essential workers, otherwise couldn't, isolate themselves, will be able to stay for the 10 or 14 day period that they have to be isolated. And then they'll be vaccinated if they wish. Um, so we're gonna have a whole different, things are gonna feel different as far as availability of vaccine, uh, conscientiousness of testing, tracing and isolation. Um, it, it is a great puzzle to me. It is a disheartening um, note to history uh, that, uh, that this has become the symbol of a political party. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I will tell you one anecdote um, because we had the same thing in 1918. There was an anti-mask party in San Francisco. Right, I remember. I totally, I, I studied it actually. Yeah. yeah. And they had and, bonfires. They burned all the masks in the, in the bonfires. Burned all the masks. They accused the people who were getting masks yeah. of being heretics. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then in December of 1918, when by wearing the masks and socially distancing themselves because they didn't have vaccine. Yeah. They had brought the cases down to just a fraction. They had a big party uh, in Union yeah. Square in San Francisco. <laughs> and they said, no more masks, we're free, and they danced. And of course, that gave rise to the biggest part of the epidemic. Yeah, exactly. I, I studied it because we were, wanted to have an Armistice Day service. And I said, well, what did we do for Armistice Day? And the archivist said we didn't have church. And I, I wasn't aware of any of that that, that, that had ever happened. Yeah, because in my right. life, there's never been a day when we didn't have church. But yeah, that's that's what I learned. I, I wonder what, um, it, through the whole course of this, what surprised you the most just about how this has just unfolded? Um, you know, uh, you, you were so well equipped to understand what was happening for, through your earlier experiences. But but what was this, what were some of the surprises within this last year for you? Well, I, I am representative of a group of infectious disease epidemiologists who've been uh, pre predicting this pandemic for 30 years. Uh, my wife says that I have correctly predicted uh, 10 of the last one pandemics. <laughs> I love that, that's great. <laughs> so, um, I, I was well prepared to predict this. Um, and, and of course I worked as the science advisor on contagion and I've been writing about pandemics for a long time. But, uh, so I think I'm just representative of that group. I'm not unique. We. We are all surprised by two things, one about the virus and the other about the government. Yeah. Um, because we, we did war games, we did tabletop exercises, even when we were making contagion, we never 
envisioned an incompetent government response. We right. always assumed that there would be a competent government. The CDC, which has always been that shining light, would continue to lead us, but it was silence. So that was a big surprise. And then the pathogenesis of the virus. I know that's a word that's not familiar to many people, but it the, the pathogenesis means the way in which the pathology, the way in which the disease progresses. That has been astonishing. The fact that a respiratory disease, because it's spread respiratory, that it could affect you nose to toes. And when you get COVID, you don't just get a pneumonia. Your liver, your kidney, your spleen, your brain are all filled with COVID and all the little micro blood vessels get a vasculitis. And as you're seeing now, uh, well over half of the people who got COVID still have some symptoms of it six months later. This is not a flu. And so that the, the extent of it is so different than what we saw with SARS and MERS, sisters or cousins, another coronavirus like COVID. But we only had those two diseases around for a few months before they burned out. And they burned out because they killed 40 or 50 or 60% of the people who got it. Right. Note to self, if you incarnate as a virus, do not have a strategy in which you kill all your customers. Kill everybody, yeah. Bad, bad strategy. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I, I, we watched Contagion again at, at the early stage of the, and it was uncanny watching it just to, to be in that experience, and then remember that we'd been told about that experience ahead of time. It, it was, um, it was, it was really interesting. I wonder if, if, if you kind of work with a presidential advisor in February, so you would, you'd basically say you should have a national policy of just immediately um, quarantining everyone. Um, is that right? What, what other advice would you give for a, 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 you know, a national leader at the beginning of, a, of, a, of something like COVID? Uh, if you look at the other countries that have done well, uh, each has done something different really, really well. Vietnam went 100 days without a single infection because they did contact tracing and they contacted 100% of contacts. Mm. We contact trace about 5%. So that's what they did well. Taiwan didn't do that well in contact tracing, but it responded so quickly that anyone who was contacted or had the disease, they were visited by part of the government, the doctor within 12 hours. Wow. Um, each of these countries that have done well have found a pattern of activities unique for their culture and for them. So it's, it's 100 different ways to succeed and there's only one way to fail. Yeah. And that's by inattention to detail and inattention, underestimating the virus. And, yeah. and that, that's, that's sort of what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. You know, disinformation is something that you always talked about, too. Um, and, you know, it's one thing to think of disinformation in, in you know, the, in, in, in the smallpox epidemic. Um, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and just like the role of the Internet um, in this. Um, just, uh, you know, what did you see and, and, and what did you notice? And, um, you know, is, is there something that tech companies like Twitter and Facebook and Google can, can do, do a little bit better in the future about? So five years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation held a meeting at its retreat in Italy in Bellagio. And the topic of the retreat is, will there be a pandemic and will there be disinformation in the pandemic? Oh, yeah. How prescient they were. Yeah. And what we talked about was things like gaming the system, like uh, financial um, investors uh, shorting the Irish pound and then putting out lies that there was a lot of the pandemic in Ireland. And then when the pound went down and value buying it back up again, we never uh -huh. dreamed of the kind of um, studious, careful disinformation campaign that Russia launched. Forget the presidential election. Right. About this pandemic. So much of the anti-vax sentiment, so much of the mask fear, so much of the disingenuity is, is actually Russian bots. Yeah. And it's a, it, it, Rockefeller predicted it, but I don't think any of us really expected it at the level that it is. Um, as far as the tech companies, um, I, I sure wouldn't give them an A, but I, I wouldn't give them as low a grade maybe I would give if we were grading on preservation of democracy. But in the case of the pandemic, they're all trying because their interests were all, all the interests are aligned. Um, I think some of the things that Facebook and, and Twitter and Salesforce and Apple 
have done it really terrific. Um, and even when they were not sure how well they're going to work, um, they, they come up with something that could work amazingly, these uh, uh, digital notification systems. Right. In their infancy, uh, they're a bit elitist now because you have to have a smartphone. But it's just the beginning. I think that there could be something really phenomenal about them as they get better and more sophisticated. Um, and if you've got a phone, you've got a chance to opt into that system. And I urge people to opt into it and use it because it will tell you if you or your phone have been within proximity of somebody who has been tested positive. You may not have known that. And that's information that you should have. Yeah, I love that. I mean, there are so many different examples of ingenuity. I just, the cathedral has a school and, you know, to keep that school open and to just figure out all the requirements. I mean, I'm, 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 it's a heroic activity. I'm, I'm so proud of our, our students, our teachers and our administrators. But I wonder if you can talk about other examples of um, creativity that you've seen that's, that's, that's come out of this, this terrible time. So I was, uh, I started this little group called Pan Defense in 2005, but I resurrected it for the, this pandemic. <laughs> Time to bring uh, it back. <laughs> it's on board. <laughs> um, and uh, so we, we were asked by the Directors Guild and the Producers Guild in Hollywood to figure out whether Hollywood could go back to work. And we designed protocols, uh, which was two tests before you come back to work, wear a mask, except when you're in front of the camera, and then get tested three times a week or every day. They worked. Hollywood sets are the safest place in America to be. We, we did the same thing for Wavy Gravy's camp. Oh, great, and great. I'm glad. Last, last summer was yeah. safe. There was no transmission of the disease on the set. Yeah. And then I did the same thing for the Democratic Convention. And I'm pleased to say that we kept it safe. We offered the technology for the Republicans. Maybe they didn't take it, but we offered it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a new way of using testing not to tell you if you have the disease, but to tell you if you will get the disease in 48 hours, if you will become infectious. And that's just one of the things. The other, of course, I have to talk about the vaccines. Yeah, I definitely want to hear about that. The mRNA vaccines are just, um, they're, they're a miracle. They, we always used to say when I was at Google that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Magic, I agree. I remember that quote. Was, I can't remember who it came from. I don't remember yeah. who said it, but yeah. we quoted it all the time whenever we were working on something great. We thought, well, this is indistinguishable from magic. This is <laughs> this is not a vaccine like uh, like Jenner in 1797, noticing that people, that milkmaids who had cowpox lesions on their fingers from milking a cow were immune Right, right, that's right. The origin exactly. of, in fact, the word vaccine comes from vacas or cow. Oh, of course, of course, that's great. Right. Somebody, I'm going to give you a vaccination. You're really saying I'm going to give you a cow. <laughs> yes, completely. But, but the mRNA uh, science is to take a set of literally computer codes and wrap it in an envelope similar to what the virus is wrapped in and then inject it so that your body makes antibodies or actually your body makes a kind of imitation virus, and then it creates antibodies to both the imitation virus and the real virus. And this is astonishingly, I'd be really surprised if it doesn't get the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, and it, I'd also be astonished if in the end, when we look back and we say, what were the things that saved us from something even worse, that the mRNA vaccines will be close to the top. Yeah, that's that's great. I'm so glad you just remind us. It's just, it, we're, I, you know, I, I just I'm, I'm so grateful every day for the folks who worked on that. You know, it was a, a global a global project, um, and and just it gives you faith in humanity when when human beings can do something like that and, and work in, something else. Yeah, that, yeah, definitely. If you look at the big vaccine companies, they're all run by CEOs, and all those CEOs of the first three at least and the fourth coming in have something in common. They're all immigrants. Uh, that's good to be reminded of too. <laughs> exactly, that's great. But we you have, know, uh, you're you're so right. And I, Hamilton, I, I, Hamilton was right. If you want to get it done, give it to an immigrant to do. I mean, we have so much gratitude for these people who have come from other places to come here yeah. and have built these vaccines. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What a good thing to remember when we think about immigration policies. You know, um, one of the things I, th I think probably everybody's asking you this, and that is like, what is, what's going to happen next? Like, 
um, we're at that multidimensional crossroads. And, and you know, um, I was at a meeting today and they were talking about um, uh, the Jewish high holy days, like Labor Day weekend time frame, um, and basically saying, you know, we, we, we're, we're not going to be able to, to celebrate those in the way that we usually do because of the pandemic. And I, I wonder just kind of like in your crystal ball, what does the future look like to you? Like when, when can we go see a movie in a movie theater in San Francisco? <laughs> Um, you know, my uh, my crystal ball has uh, broken and my prospect, <laughs> of, uh, uh, I guess I didn't plug it in. It, <laughs> I, I think I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, vaccine supply will begin to exceed demand in the early summer, the June, July time frame. That will be the time that anybody who wants a vaccine can just go down to their Walgreens or CVS and get it. That will be a big change. And then we look at what happens when there's more supply than demand. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's in the United States. But for the rest of the world, not so. A mm. hundred countries will not be able to get enough vaccine to vaccinate a quarter of their population over the next several years. WHO has put together something called COVAX, which is a funding organization, and they only have been able to raise enough money to provide 2 billion doses of vaccine. The math is pretty clear. There's seven and a half billion of us, a high percentage will require two doses. Yeah. We don't have enough vaccine. So that means more cases. And it's one of the rare, rare moments when your spiritual life, your ethical training, your scientific training, your sense of justice and your selfishness are all perfectly aligned. It, it, in fact, I can't think of it other time. Because if you don't help the rest of the world vaccinate its own population, then you'll have hundreds of billions more viruses, billions more cases, hundreds of billions of more mutations, replicants, and then variants of concern. And that's, the, the truth is they're all gonna come back into the United States. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're gonna export ours and there's gonna be this kind of ping-ponging back and forth, whack-a-mole between states that have done a good job and countries that have done a good job. But we really need to think about the global mission that we have of working together with countries all over, whatever your politics are. If you still believe that it should be US out of UN, <laughs> whatever you believe, this is not the time for that. This is the time for all in, working together, helping to find a way to get enough vaccine for everyone. And, and also, I would say, helping to create more innovations. You know, we can do some of the things we did in smallpox. We can find every case. We can vaccinate around it. We can do some of the things we did in Ebola. You know, we were very good in uh, stopping Ebola two years ago. Let's look at the countries that are good role models. I, I think I failed to mention that Taiwan and New Zealand and um, in Singapore, I'll have another thing in common. They're all run by women. Right, right. I mean, these are all really interesting nuggets to, def you know, to uh, argue against so many uh, stereotypes. <laughs> but we need to work together with uh, 200 countries and find a way. That this is, uh, if you remember the biblical injunction that the least of you, whoever, Yes. Does kind to the least of you does so for me. Yeah. It's never been more true in the secular way than it is right now. Yeah, it's so interesting. I just remember in the 1990s, just I was working for the United Nations for the Millennium Development Goals and was at a conference at the Vatican in Rome. And it was the first time I realized that global poverty is a choice. We we can eradicate poverty. And it's the same thing here. It's just that. It, it, and it's really about a spiritual reality of the value of every single human life. And um, it, th th my guest next week is Judith Butler, the professor from UC Berkeley, and she writes extensively about, about this. And she talks about grievability. Like, it is, it is, there are some lives that we just don't, we don't grieve over. And, uh, there's, um, and this is, like you say, this moment of, 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 of when all those things come together. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you about, too, which is just, and I, this was like a huge question I had for the last three months, and that is um, just about just kind of like the ethics of of, of pri making priorities in terms of how you vaccinate people in a society, right? 
So how do you decide to like do an age-based criterion or work like what their people's jobs is as, as the criterion or like what are what are kind of the, the ethical challenges of how you decide to to vaccinate people by category versus just randomly, for instance? Yeah, I, I have a very different view than most people. I think that the person you should vaccinate first is the person who stands to be the next person to get infected and to infect others. Mm. That that takes priority over all these other decisions. That being said, there are good and noble reasons for vaccinating communities. The African American community accounted for 80% of the deaths in Georgia for the first six months. Mm. Nursing home community accounted for 75% of the deaths in the Bay Area for the first six months. The Hispanic community has a death rate three times higher than the white community. Nursing homes, first responders, doctors and nurses working in, in hospitals to keep them running or else you'll add deaths from a heart attack and difficult pregnancies to the list of things that are caused by the virus if everybody else in the hospital has COVID. There's good reasons for every one of those choices, but it did get to me and I hope my friends don't misunderstand. When I read that the Railway Workers Union said either we prioritize vaccinating railway workers or they're gonna stop the trains. Hmm. And, and of course, they're as right as anybody else. Don't get me wrong. But when I realized that because of an absence of federal leadership and a plan, we left everybody on their own. So of course, everybody looked to their own interests and their own community and to people who looked like them or who worked like they did. That's not right. This disease can only be stopped because you stop the disease. And it's good reasons to vaccinate so many different communities. And it was friends of mine, Bill Fagy and Lean Gale, who chaired that committee on equitable distribution. But I think it was too complicated. I don't think people could understand it. Um, I think people were extremely frustrated. Uh, it advantaged people who had digital literacy. They could get on and, you know, game the system. Appointment, yeah. But but it, it, these are short-term problems. We have much bigger problems. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was just interested, and I'm glad that you explained that a little bit. I, I just, you know, I, um, I think part of this, again, it goes back to just, you know, having kind of national leadership and national standards so that you don't have one standard for Marin County and another for Contra Costa, another for Alameda, um, but but everything is clear and well communicated and it's uniform. I think it, it helps a lot. And, and, and I think that's what we just keep learning again and again with this. But, you know, um, you probably remember one of our traditions that we take questions from um, the folks who are, are watching. And so we have a, um, a few questions tonight that are coming in. Um, considering um, teachers and with all the new and upcoming variants, should schools be opening at this time? Well, I know. What a great question. So, so I mean, uh, multiple crossroads? Yes. Here's another one. Uh, kids do not get as good an education virtually as they do in person. Uh, disadvantaged kids are doubly disadvantaged because of a lack of access to technology. We need to get our kids back to school. We know how to do it. We, we can test the kids and test the teachers, even without vaccinations, and make, make schools safe. But it's really expensive. Yeah. So... I would look at this moment where we're all looking at the ski slope of the outbreak. It looks like it's coming down, but the truth is it's beginning to plateau. Yeah, yeah. Huge outbreak, speaking about schools at the Naval Academy right now, maybe the outbreak is growing, doubling every two days, 25% of the midshipmen are infected. Oh my goodness. It's easier to open a school than it is to keep it open in an outbreak like this. And I don't think we're gonna be bottoming out to zero I think we're gonna be plateauing and I worry about the cadence of Easter Sunday, Memorial Day, 4th of July. And I don't want to see happen what just happened with Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's. So right. I'm really worried um, about opening schools unless in this stimulus package, there remains enough money to get the schools safe, to fix the ventilation system, to make sure the teachers are taken care of and those teachers who are high risk get vaccinated and those kids who are at high risk get, their, get cared for and that we 
we deal with that school with the same care that we're able to deal with the Democratic National Party Convention or Hollywood or any of these things. And there is money in that stimulus package now for that. I hope it survives the cut. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer, um, and it's good to know too that it's just it is a matter of money and will to to. Here's the next question: the, um, the New Yorker has an article this week about the small percentage of deaths in many countries, poor countries, for example, India, compared to Western countries. The author had several possibilities, but no conclusion. Do you have any thoughts about this? India is a paradox. Um, the, the one thing that you're not hearing about India is they do a, a poor job of reporting COVID. So they under-report. But I think for Africa, which has an average age 15, 16, 17, compared to the US, which are 35, 36, 37, um, the attack rate is so much higher. The, the attack rate of, of visible COVID, not uh, asymptomatic COVID, is so much greater. Uh, the age structure of the population is one answer. Um, I've heard all sorts of things like Jasmine and turmeric and BCG vaccine. I don't think it's those things. Um, I do think that poorer countries tend to be more outdoors countries. People in India live outdoors and, and come home to rest. It's not like we do. We, we stay at home, we go out to rest. Um, I lived in India for 10 years. It is an outdoor um, environment. So I think if you add all those things together, outdoors, lower age, uh, of a lower average age, poor reporting. I think all those are part of it. Um, they also have a government which has a little Trumpian kind of characteristics. And it, it isn't clear to me that the, the full, full communication is coming through. Mm -hmm. Africa's a bit more complicated. It's 40 some odd countries. Uh, each one's different. There's a huge outbreak in South Africa that led, gave rise to the South African variant. And South Africa's probably the richest or one of the richest countries in Africa. Um, we have a couple of states in Africa where they're not letting people wear masks and a couple of states in Africa, countries in Africa, where the mask wearing is obligatory. So you can't think of it as one place. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer, but the person- I think those are those are great answers. I, they're very helpful for me too. There's, that demographic difference is huge. And again, like you said, there's like these huge cultural differences and, and it means that we fight COVID in a different way, slightly in different societies. I mean, here's another question, which is a great question. So simple. Why do some people have worse side effects from the second shot and others don't? Do we know why? No. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we know that people who have long COVID, long haul COVID, because they um, have a, uh, the, th those who the long haul COVID is due to an autoimmune phenomenon, as opposed to a of vasculitis, those people tend to, if they had had two vac vaccinations, tend to have had a more robust reaction. So it may be that the people having that robust reaction would have gotten the worst COVID. I don't know if that's true, but a lot of my colleagues seem to think that that's the fact. So that's that's another, maybe that's just a reason to pretend that it's all the trouble you went through in that second vaccine that gave you such a kick, it was really worth it. But at least some people believe that that's the fact. Yeah, that's so interesting. Again, it's just, there's so much that we still are learning about the disease. It's important to be reminded of that. I um, mean, here's a question. I've heard that Ebola was controlled through vaccination circles where you vaccinate outbreak areas at a higher rate. Should we do that in high risk areas here? Like cities with high infection rates get more vaccinated, vaccinations first? Well, that, that is actually what I'm working on all, all day today, the last two weeks. It's it, We called it ring vaccination, which is not a really good term, but that's how we eradicated smallpox. We found every case. We traced it backwards to where it came from. We found all the people who were infected by that original index case. And then we uh, contact traced forward everybody who was part of the first case we found and then we isolated them. We brought food to them so they didn't have to leave to go out and you know, get food. And then we vaccinated them. Yeah. And so that combination is what allowed us to eradicate smallpox uh, in the last four countries uh, that, in the world. Um, Ebola did something similar. They also did ring vaccination. They didn't have as good a vaccine, 
that Ebola vaccine had 55% efficacy, but it worked very well in concert with isolation. And it was an addition, not instead of uh, vaccinating a lot of people and isolating them. I'm looking for ways that we can use that experience, that success story, those success stories, and find a way to put it to use. Um, and uh, stay tuned. There's a lot of people working on this. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I thought about that too. Um, what kinds of decades-long health impacts do you expect for the 28 million U.S. COVID survivors? I'm thinking about the implications for the U.S. healthcare system. Yeah, I mean, for starters, every one of them now has a pre-existing condition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the knock-on effects of this vasculitis, which will include, or has included in many people, strokes, has included in many people, um, you know, pancreatitis and liver disease. Uh, we have people who got this disease the first weeks of the outbreak and still have it. Mm. Uh, we have other people who, who who don't think they had it, but they're in, their immune status, their serum epidemiology says they did have it. So the spectrum couldn't be greater from it was less than the flu to I died. I mean, it was yeah. really, it's, it's really complex. Yeah, it is. Um, within the faith community, there was quite a range in response to the government's public health mandates, especially as it related to public worship. What can we learn from COVID regarding religious freedom and public health protection efforts? That was, my, that was a good question, though. So Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institute of Health, is a devout Christian. He writes extensively about living two lives. In fact, I interviewed him at the Commonwealth Club about eight years ago on his faith and um, how he struggled with science and faith. And if you have a chance to listen to that, it's a radio show. It's on their website. He was phenomenal and reassuring that you don't have to give up one to serve the other. Um, you know, I think that we've all known since the country began <clears throat> that the separation of church and state is part of our DNA. It's the people who first came to this country, the pilgrims were fleeing religious persecution. We never wanted to institute an establishment of religion. The more we lean towards the establishment of religion, the more we're leaning backwards to those times in history that we fled such a place to come to the United States. I worry about an exemption for churches, um, unless that exemption is for every religion. And I worry also about just the sheer magnitude of large gatherings of people, whether that it's a barbecue or whether it's a religious activity. We know that the major super spreader event is lots of people indoors without masks, singing and cheering and talking and yelling and praising. <laughs> so it, it does bother me. Um, and when I studied the first outbreak in Seattle, the major super spreader event in Seattle was a choir. A choir. Yeah, I and they were, doing, they, were, they were just singing praises. And you could even see that the people who were closest to the infected person sitting in the rows were the ones who got the worst disease. So um, let's, let's just say this. <clears throat> Whether the place that you are uh, has a crescent, a moon, or a star of David, or a cross on it, the virus doesn't understand that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've got to say, I just, I, I think that public health directives should be based on what's safe and what's not safe, and whether the, the, it's a church or a movie theater or a, a shopping mall or a dentist's office. Um, it, 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 it just you need to come up with the rules based on what 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 uh, makes the virus propagate, not based on you know what it is that people are doing in those places. Here's another question. They say there are more intellectual property patents held by immigrants, and that because of the immigrant experience of breaking schema, we are thinking outside the existing paradigm. Do you think it is because we have continuous immigration that has added to our ability to be innovative? Well, of course. I mean, uh, actually, a good place to look for that is in the real estate market. Uh, you'll see that a lot of uh, big companies are abandoning the idea of having a uh, headquarters where everybody has to come to work on the same day and have staff meetings, and that the only people they can then hire are within a 50-mile radius of that office. They, they say, why shouldn't I select the best people from anywhere in the world 
because with Zoom, they can participate. And we have been, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan's uh, shining city on a hill. Um, we People have come here from countries in which it is very difficult to live day to day, let alone to start a company, have an idea, bring it to fruition. Sergey Brin, Steve Jobs, I mean, oh, yeah. you can go on and on. So it, it is to me, um, I think, maybe a uh, affirmation that by uh, opening our arms to the world, we get the best of the world. And um, as I said, the, the leaders of three of the top um, vaccine manufacturing companies are, are immigrants. It's not only immigrants that do a great job. We, we shouldn't forget that, but we shouldn't ignore their contributions either. Yeah, I totally appreciate that. I just, I think being in an open society where you do have those connections around the world, it just promotes just a, a lively intellectual environment also and a richer culture too. Um, here's a question. I noticed a Buddha above you in the background. Please describe your spiritual practice. Oh, maybe my wife would. I uh, know Gertrude yeah. could tell the truth. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're certainly, uh, I mean, when I was first asked this, when we came back from India, because I say we lived in India for 10 years, and then I became a professor, and Giriji got her PhD at the University of Michigan, and I was being interviewed once, and this was the Midwest. So they said, what is your religion? And they gave me a list, and I said, I don't see mine. It, it should be the last one. It should say all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> I don't, I don't, that's why we love you, Delary. That's I, perfect. <laughs> that's, that's the one I want. Yeah. Um, well, I've learned so much from uh, Buddhism and Buddhist meditation. I've learned so much from Judaism. I've learned so much from Christianity and my love for Jesus and my love for the Gospels. I've learned so much from reading the Quran and understanding what what charity means in Islam and all the noble uh, quests from monotheism of Zoroastrianism. Um, there isn't a religion from which I haven't learned something and to which I'm not grateful. And um, yeah, it, it, I don't have room up above me of all the gods and goddesses and deities. I particularly like Buddha. I, I like the equanimity. Uh, I like the um, I like the search for peace. I like the quietness of it. I like the community that's called the sangha. Um, I, I love the teachings, but I could be saying the same thing about. Uh, uh, Episcopalianism <laughs> very easily. Well, I, I think that's, I mean, that's the reason why we're just such spiritual brothers because I do, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I learned, I've learned so much from Zen meditation practices, from um, stories from Hinduism, from, um, from, from all the, all, all the religions that you've mentioned. Um, what a blessing that we live in a time where we can communicate with each other. And we're not in some small, tiny village where we know nothing about what people are doing in the rest of the world. And, what a gift it is to have you, uh, such a gift to creation, someone so passionate about um, the search for truth and someone so committed to helping people around the world to, to, to um, be healed and whole and happy. And I'm just so glad we, we're actually, we run out of time, <laughs> so a, but it has been such a blessing to have you. I just I thank you so much for being, being here tonight. Oh, Malcolm, and aren't we lucky to live in the city of St. Francis? Oh, uh, we are. We are. We to welcome immigrants and welcome all of these religious traditions and, and seek to learn from their places that that's not true, even in our own country. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to, uh, to Grace Cathedral. Uh, it has been uh, the host of many events that are the most important in my life, and I, I love the community. Thank you for inviting me back. And and Gerija, who's hiding behind that screen that says Larry Brilliant, that is not Larry Brilliant. That is Gerija Brilliant. And she's there and she would join me in saying how much we love all of you. Yeah. And that's again, we love you so much, Gerija. The two of you are such an extraordinary partnership and we're just blessed by you. Thank you very much. For all of the rest of you, please join me next week when my guest will be Judith Butler, author of the groundbreaking Gender Trouble. And she'll be talking about her latest book, The Force of Nonviolence. You can help us bring the arts to life at Grace Cathedral with a gift today to the forum. Please text Grace, uh, Grace to, to 76278 or visit gracecathedral.org backslash give to grace. And Larry, it's so good to see you. I, I, um, I never know when it is that we'll be brought back into each other's orbit, but each time is such a pleasure. Um, God bless you both. And I, I hope you are well. And I look forward to when I can see you both in, in person.
Thank you. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Yep. Good night, everybody. Good night.